From the dawn of civilization, man's reach has far exceeded his grasp. Yet today, on the threshold of travel into space, it is hard to believe that the conquest of the air has been with us for less than a lifetime. Even now, few realize that the pioneering efforts of Sir Frank Whittle and his contemporaries back in the 30s was responsible for adding a new shape, a new sound, and a new conception to the future of air travel, the jet engine. From birth, the jet engine has grown rapidly in importance, so that today it powers the majority of civil and military aircraft. This new engine breed can with ease thrust an aircraft through the sky at 600, 700, 800 and even 1400 miles per hour, a far cry from the doddering 300 miles an hour of the previous decade. This rapid evolution of the gas turbine engine has entailed intense research and development effort by Rolls-Royce, Bristol Sidley, and of course, the National Gas Turbine Establishment at Pystock. There can be no doubt that the worldwide use of the gas turbine has added new dimensions to speed and comfort in flight. But it must be remembered that these new high-speed aircraft have demanded longer and longer runways, and their noise often causes serious discomfort to people living in the shadow of major airports. Clearly, aircraft which take off and land vertically, the helicopter is a typical example, do not need long runways. The problem has been to harness the power of the gas turbine engine in such a way as to provide with maximum efficiency the horizontal thrust required for high speed, normal forward flight, and the lifting thrust required for vertical ascent and descent. With this sort of application in mind, one of the early advocates of vertical takeoff and landing techniques, the late Dr. Griffith of Rolls-Royce, realized that small, ultra-lightweight gas turbine engines could be used in sufficient numbers to provide enough thrust to lift large aircraft vertically into the air. Rolls-Royce followed up this idea and developed a unique family of lift engines, progressively increasing thrust to weight ratio from the 8 to 1 of a decade ago through 16 to 1 to the 20 to 1 designs of today. That is to say that these engines lift 8 times, 16 times and 20 times their own weight. By comparison, the Circus Strongman would need to lift 1,600 weight, 3,200 weight, and finally, two tons, quite a feat of strength. Another approach by Bristol Sidley was to build into a propulsion engine the vertical lift capability using a technique known as vectored thrust. This kind of engine is used in the Hawker Sidley P1127 aircraft. Meanwhile, at Pystock, research is undertaken in support of that done in industry. For example, this particular experiment is aimed at better understanding of the operational problems of the P1127. The use of these lifting engine techniques offers a solution to the problem of long runways, but they do not as yet offer any solution to the problem of disturbance by noise. The evolution of the gas turbine engine and its application to both orthodox and vertical takeoff aircraft is to some extent a matter of history. But what of the future? Reaching out even further, scientists and engineers at Pystock have devised a new technique which for the want of a better description is called circulation control by blowing. Since 1959, when work started on a research program aimed at a complete departure from the normal aerofoil lifting surface, the object has been to produce a lifting device in which the puff and blow of a gas turbine engine forms an integral part of the mechanism. This device is a long slender cylinder with compressed air blown from the long thin blowing slot. In this way, air is circulated around the cylinder. This is clearly shown by the behavior of the wool tufts. By itself, this circulation does not produce a lifting force. And if the circulation air is turned off and wind tunnel air is blown over the cylinder to produce an effect similar to forward flight, there is still no lift. 
The violent fluttering of the wool tufts behind the model indicate that in this condition the cylinder produces high drag. But now, with the wind tunnel air passing over the cylinder and with compressed air blown from the long thin slot, lift is produced. At the same time, the violent fluttering of the wool tufts is reduced and we now have high lift and low drag, which is the aim of all aircraft designers and aerodynamicists. This particular discovery has provided the key to a simplified form of helicopter and again to a form of aircraft which is effectively a helicopter as regards its efficiency and noise levels at takeoff and landing yet still retains jet aircraft standards of speed and comfort in cruising flight. Let us first consider what would happen if an orthodox type of helicopter rotor was used to provide vertical lift for this fixed wing aircraft. Remembering, of course, that to enable the aircraft to fly at high forward speed, the rotor has to be stopped in flight. The effect of air gusts on the orthodox rotor rules out this approach, because the advancing blade has a high air speed which produces high lift. Whereas the retreating blade has little or no lift. The difference between full lift on one side of the aircraft and none on the other side could cause an uncontrollable aircraft roll which might well turn the aircraft onto its back. But if this orthodox rotor is replaced by the circulation controlled lifting rotor there is no danger of the aircraft overturning because as it slows down prior to parking the circulation control blowing slots are turned off leaving only a rotating pole which is not affected by gusts. With this type of rotor there is no insoluble problem in stopping, parking or restarting it. Only when the rotor reaches its correct running speed is the circulation control air and hence the lift turned on. A scale model of such a rotor, 12 feet overall diameter, with rotor blades with a diameter or cord of about five and a half inches was constructed at Pystock and it has completed nearly 1,000 hours of intensive research testing. It is clearly robust. It has none of the hinges of the orthodox helicopter rotor and it requires minimum maintenance in service. In addition to providing lift, this rotor also produces the control forces necessary to pitch and roll the aircraft. This is done by varying the amount of air emerging from the slots along each blade as the rotor rotates. In order to achieve simplicity and thereby aim for high reliability, this cyclic control is produced in the non-rotating part of the rotor hub. All these effects have been tested in the 24-foot wind tunnel at the RAE, covering both the hover and forward flight conditions. As small-scale wind tunnel tests on the live aerofoil suggest, the lift of the rotor varies little as tunnel speed is increased. Here, the air speed of the tunnel is divided by the rotor tip speed and called advance ratio. Similarly, the rotor is balanced aerodynamically by trimming the cyclic control. In this way, the performance and controllability of this new class of rotor can be demonstrated before the associated aircraft flies. The remaining aerodynamic effect which has to be investigated to provide complete aircraft design information is the interaction effect between the rotor and the aircraft wing. In the course of the RAE 24-foot tunnel test, a wing was mounted six inches below the rotor blades. This experiment not only demonstrated the feasibility of the stopped rotor aircraft, it also showed that early assumptions of the loss of lift were pessimistic. As forward flight rotor testing must continue when the 24-foot tunnel is occupied with other work, a test vehicle has been constructed to carry the rotor along a runway at speed. Two main problems had to be overcome in the design of this vehicle. These were isolation of the rotor and its force measuring balance from road bumps, and the provision of sufficient acceleration to get the vehicle up to the high speeds required for the test in the limited runway length available. The first problem is illustrated in this diagram. These are the sources of vibration which might affect the rotor force measurement. Here are the resonances which these forces might excite.
And this is the technique which solves the problem. The rotor and the Aben engine, which provides compressed air for it, are carried on a subframe mounted on air springs to give a soft ride without jeopardizing the controllability of the basic vehicle chassis. To improve the acceleration of the vehicle, the thrust of the Avon engine is used. And now with vehicle engine plus 3,000 pounds thrust. Approaching the desired speed, the nozzles are pointed sideways and the final adjustment of speed is made using the normal vehicle engine. Finally, reversed thrust is used to help slow down the vehicle at the end of the test run, a very necessary precaution. With equipment such as this, the further research work required for full understanding of this new feature of the stop rotor aircraft will proceed apace. Pystock study of a possible aircraft based on a conversion of the BAC 111 suggests that with this rotor scheme it would be possible to hover with only one of the two Spey engines working, thus giving the necessary flight safety in the event of an engine failure. Such an aircraft would have a tremendous potential. It could fly with a full load from the centre of London to the centre of Paris, or the centre of Leicester to the centre of Lille. With this simple, hingeless, rigid design, it is now possible for the first time safely to stop and start the rotor in flight. But what is most important, its noise should not disturb or annoy people living close to city terminals. Sir Frank Whittle gave us the jet engine, and with it, speed and comfort. With their circulation-controlled lifting rotor, the engineers and scientists at Pystock and Associated Research and Development Centres are reaching out towards an aircraft which is reliable, flexible and fast, safe and relatively silent. From what you have just seen, you may judge that it is well within their grasp. Mm -hmm.